Everybody, uh, it seems like a pretty good turnout to the first EOS Waterloo meetup uh, info session. Um, this is fantastic. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the University of Waterloo for donating the room to us. Um, that was very good of them. Uh, um, they saw the the value in in uh, getting us in front of some students and the community. So that's that's great. Um, so I just want to introduce myself so that uh, everyone knows where I'm coming from. I am a, I, I'm a UW grad, UW alumni from 2008. Uh, I took the systems design program uh, here, so going through co-op, uh, did a lot of different placements, different applications using uh, various computer languages, uh, web development, assembly stuff, C++ um, in robotics. Uh, I graduated uh, and started working as a hardware designer, uh, doing electronics and um, mechanical design stuff for consumer electronics at a local company uh, here called Kaleidoscape. So I just want to make it clear that I'm not uh, affiliated with EOS.io or Block.1. Uh, I'm just trying to facilitate some of the community around here uh, to create more awareness of some of the funding opportunities and just really what EOS is doing because um, it's a very exciting uh, blockchain, in my opinion, coming from the consumer space uh, and can get overshadowed maybe by some of the larger giants in the, the field right now. Um, but as some of you may know, it's, it's uh, going to be launched soon, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, and the other reason is just because uh, blockchain's pretty, uh, um, pretty good in general. There's, there's a lot of money in the space. And, uh, It'd be great to bring some of that to Waterloo uh, and encourage the community to grow here and encourage the tech uh, community here. Um, so, let's see. Maybe this thing timed out while I was holding it. Oh, my clicker is not working. Awesome. Yeah, that's why we're all here, right? Um, I think I have to, oh, there we go. Okay, awesome. Um, so blockchain's really hot right now. That's why we're all here. Um, that's why I'm here, like, reading about it. Uh, just, I found this was interesting uh, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn thinks that uh, blockchain talent is the hottest skill at the moment right now. So if there were any doubt, uh, LinkedIn is telling us that there's definitely a lot of opportunity here. Uh, so that's pretty important from uh, for the student community, I guess. Uh, just like that. And there, it's hot right now because we're going through a blockchain revolution, right? There's a lot of new interactions that are being created. There's um, new ways of organizing businesses. Uh, two parties on the other side of the world can uh, connect and make electronic payments to each other without third parties. So there's a lot of efficiencies being created in that space, uh, middlemen being taken out of the equation. Uh, Eventually, when I can put my VR goggles on and surf the 3D internet, I can take a virtual dollar bill and hand it to someone, and they can kind of put it in their virtual pocket, too. Uh, so that's a really interesting, exciting. Uh, there's greater privacy and security uh, enabled by blockchain. Every time you make a transaction, you don't need to enter your entire identity just to make that transaction go through, um, even if they're not sending you some physical asset you still have to put in your address. And I think everyone's kind of familiar with all the hacking that's going on where uh, user data is continuously compromised. Uh, so it, it's a nice feeling to be in more control of uh, your identity and your information <coughs> and watching and do that. Um, there's these massive uh, computer infrastructures being created right now by communities who are engaged in these projects uh, just some of them just setting up for uh, on goodwill because they want to be a part of the project, uh, some of them for profit. Um, but these community-run infrastructures are very resilient to attack. Uh, they're self-healing. They're always on. Um, they're decentralized, so they're a better way uh, to set up those uh, infrastructures than the centralized models uh, going forward. They're much more resilient should anything emergency situations happen imagine if uh, if the internet were to shut down and all your money is tied up in your bank that you can't get out uh, because the ATMs are down and, and their infrastructure are down as well um, 
new business models are being enabled. There's the concepts of self-assembling uh, companies, uh, collectives. Um, people are engaging the community to work for them through bounties uh, and being able to tokenize that and track it um, and kind of use the community to create demand for their tokens and businesses to uh, make uh, money for the early um, adopters and those involved in the project from the start. Uh, and on top of all that, there's uh, global currencies and virtual economies being created, uh, not fixed to geographic borders uh, that are um, include digital producers and consumers so people can create digital assets, uh, put a price tag on them and get rewarded for them. Um, in a community method uh, or a community kind of ecosystem, which is all really exciting ideas. Um, and so, really, how does that fit into everything? I just wanted to prime everyone on that. What's a DAC? Sorry. Uh, Decentralized Autonomous Collective. Okay. Uh, I'll get into a bit of that later on the slide as well. Ooh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, feel free to put your hand up uh, to ask a question or a clarifier. Okay. Yeah. Why is that compared to a DAO? It's very similar. It's just um, what you want to call it. Yeah, DAO and DAC. DAC is how Dan Lammer uh, refers to it, given that he's involved with EOS, uh, decided to use that one. Um, so, I mean, I probably wouldn't be in front of you if uh, EOS had not initially committed a billion dollars of VC funds to the community. Um, and this is something, being in a tech community, I thought very important that uh, people should be aware of. It's a much different, uh, it's pretty unprecedented. It's very interesting that through EOS.io's crowd sale, they were able to raise uh, such a large sum of money and then commit to putting it back into the ecosystem because they know that it's about the community and it's about building uh, and enabling new technologies to um, get the EOS platform to critical mass so that it's useful. Um, uh, 50 million, so of that billion, 50 million has already been um, assigned to Tomorrow Blockchain, run our Eric Schmidt's VC fund. Uh, 350 million has been uh, deployed or assigned to Galaxy Digital, um, like Novograd's fund, and then 100 million just the other day was assigned to FinLab in Europe. Um, so I guess the 400 million is kind of North America, but it's a global uh, funding. Um, so if you know anyone doing startups uh, and looking for funding, this is and and uh, working on blockchain, then this is a possible route for you to take. Um, and to be honest, I don't know a whole lot of this program. That's like how the structure of that VC program works. Uh, all there is is to me, I've just seen an email uh, VC at block one to learn more. I haven't tried to email that, um, but hopefully the Ever PD guys can give us a bit of insight into that because they have uh, raised 30 million through that fund, uh, through Mike Novogratz's uh, Galaxy Digital Fund. Um, but I think the key takeaway is from EOS.io's press release is that they are saying that the funding is to create community-driven businesses, uh, and what does that really mean? I'll get into that uh, later on um, in the presentation, um, but first, uh, if anyone hears, the, the, the audiences for blockchain meetups seem to be very varied, so, or, or widely varied, and I mean, you came to learn about EOS, so I'll go into um, what EOS is first. So what is EOS? Uh, I, when I first learned about EOS, it was very hard to understand. I do a lot of reading, um, discussion with a lot of people. So what, it, what EOS is, generally speaking, is a blockchain operating system for deploying public or private blockchains. Uh, EOS.io seems to be improving blockchain performance by a factor of 10 um, uh, when you compare it to Ethereum. Improving governance of blockchain <coughs> communities and adding uh, a lot more user-friendly management features to allow dApps to um, make it uh, like if someone loses their account key then uh, that that application can possibly get their key back for them to enable them to reaccess their funds whereas a lot of the ecosystems right now if you lose your key it's gone and your funds are gone um, so this is the who so we're really bright and we're really contrasted on this uh, this uh, presentation 
But uh, the uh, let me walk over here in case uh, everybody is watching that slide. Actually, there's probably in front of them. Um, so block the core or the 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 guys really running block dot one. The the big big names in the company, uh, the core developing team um, that are developing EOS.io, the open source platform, uh, is Dan Larimer, CTO, and Brendan Bloomer. Um, they're big names because Dan Larimer has been in blockchain space uh, for since it really uh, started, at least from what I read. I mean, I've never met Dan, so this is just second hand. But uh, um, he co-founded BitShares, which is a decentralized exchange. A lot of the crypto exchanges or, or blockchain exchanges, um, cryptocurrency exchanges, are centralized, uh, where that's why you might read about things being hacked uh, and people losing a lot of money, uh, like the one in Japan with the NEM coin. Um, that's because all those keys are still stored in a central uh, memory base, and someone can hack in and grab all those keys and move the money out. With a decentralized exchange, you're the owner of your key, and people can't hack in and steal your funds through that body. Um, so that was very forward looking. Um, there's mass adoption, and obviously, a decentralized exchange needs a lot of transactions per second, so um, that's why Dan is very interested in. Uh, uh, in, increasing the amount of transactions per second that any blockchain can perform. Uh, he was also a co-founder, so after that project, uh, his dad actually took, took it over and ran it, uh, Stan Larimer, and then he co-founded uh, Steemit, which is a social network on the blockchain. It it's a blogging platform uh, that allows uh, creators to, or writers and creators to make blog, uh, uh, make blogs, get rewarded for them, and also users to get curating awards as well. So if they upvote an article early on, then it can get uh, they get rewarded for spotting a good article, um, and that's real money that they can then sell uh, to on an exchange and and, uh, and fund their lifestyle that way. Um, Brandon Bloomer uh, also. A big name in software space, age 15, founded Gamecliff, uh, selling virtual assets. So he would basically uh, play video games, I guess, from his friends, and they get these sought after assets and then sell them online. Uh, that was bought um, by Brock Pierce's company in Hong Kong. He then went to Hong Kong and helped run that as well. And they further developed that. Uh, model of, of selling game states for um, massive multiplayer games, uh, which is also very interesting, kind of where this crypto space kind of came from, is the in-game economies that, uh, that were forming. Um, he also then started two significant real estate software service companies in Asia and India, uh, which I find really interesting considering that, I mean, the EOS is a bit of an escrow model uh, blockchain, and uh, you could run some fairly massive real estate um, transactions on uh, an EOS blockchain. Um, so maybe there's something uh, there, but that's all speculation. Um, so what are uh, some of the EOS software features? Um, I'm kind of assuming that with these slides, I'm assuming that uh, people have some background in blockchain. So if I lose you, it's okay. I'm going to come back to a bit more high level stuff. Um, with EOS, uh, there's no fees per transaction. So with typical blockchains right now, like Ether and Bitcoin, you're paying every time you uh, make a transaction. Um, with EOS, it's more about locking tokens up. We're putting in a savings account, and that savings uh, will allow you to uh, use bandwidth on the computer network that runs the EOS blockchain, or an application can assign uh, some tokens on your behalf and allow you to do free transactions. So that no fees per transaction is really to allow applications greater freedom in how they want to monetize um, their decentralized applications. Uh, fast response time. Um, with Ethereum and Bitcoin, you're waiting maybe, you could be, you could be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but it can also be hours depending on which the network. Um, uh, traffic at the time, um, and that's just the way that they're structured. This EOS.io is structured to use a delegated proof of stake uh, uh, consensus model, 
that um, allows it to run faster and allows blocks to be created in uh, sub-second uh, timings. So when you're doing a user interface and you're upvoting some article, you want basically uh, really good synchronization and fast response time um, for that application to see that the blockchain state has updated. Um, so any, if you're trying to run an app right off the blockchain, then that's really important. Um, also for decentralized exchanges too. Uh, so watching the Telegram channels, um, there's, Dan has alluded to uh, EOS getting 1,000 transactions per second single-threaded. Um, EOS also has plans to implement parallelization of the blockchain, um, which would allow for even faster transactions, but there's certain things you have to do to get there, so that's more on the horizon. Uh, it's a smart contract platform, most of Ethereum. Um, it has much more of a governance layer to it than, uh, say, the current blockchains out there. In, that includes the users, um, not just the developers. Right now, um, it's mostly developers that get to, um, and block producers, any, any of the miners really uh, get to decide what kind of features go into the platform where uh, as a user, you get, you get to vote um, basically for, for what the future holds uh, using the governance model and what kind of features you want or how you want the blockchain to evolve. Um, and you don't have to vote, you can decide to vote, uh, it's up to you. Um, user agreement, uh, so there's also a constitution if you're participating on the blockchain. Uh, there's much like if you're participating, you're downloading an app, an app or you're using an app off the app store, if there's a user agreement that you get to look through and have the enjoyment of reading, but it defines um, kind of how those parties interact, uh, what the obligations are um, for people on the blockchain. And that's important, um, just recently it popped up that Bitcoin has a lot of weird content on the blockchain, I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, but it, that's, you can store data on the blockchain and who's responsible for that data, so it's important to set those legal boundaries and uh, also to set where any disputes, what kind of, what jurisdiction uh, would any disputes occur or be litigated in. Uh, so that's what the user, if, if it comes down to that, that's what the user constitution is for. And it's signed into every transaction um, so that it's uh, obviously agreed upon by both parties when they enter into a transaction. Um, the EOS software allows uh, freezing of malfunctioning contracts. If um, something's going awry and doing something that you didn't intend to, then block producers can freeze contracts if they need to, if it's from the network. Um, basically an emergency measure that um, a lot of, uh, 17 out of 21 block producers need to approve. There's uh, account permission levels and key recovery features that I was talking about. Something exciting is the Apple Secure Enclave support, um, so you could potentially do transactions by um, using a fingerprint or face identification. You can impl implement apps or wallets like that. Uh, and the EOS software or the EOS network provides file storage as well, so it can operate as a content distribution network um, via the, I the IPFS protocol, which is the Interplanetary File System Protocol. Which is a really interesting protocol to read about if you have time to. Um, but so I, I keep talking about block producers um, and like what are those and how many are them on the system. A block producer is like a miner, if you, uh, with the analogy to Bitcoin. Um, the, as I said before, EOS software is open source. It's an operating system that can run private and public blockchains. So you could start a company on it or uh, someone can start a, a large public ledger on it as well. Um, and there is plans for a large public uh, blockchain which is set for launch in June, and this is what it will look like um, with 21 block producers as the parameter. If you start your own private blockchain, you don't need to do 21 block producers, you can set your own amount, I believe, you can just modify uh, the, the structure of it. Um, but basically what happens is the community, which has been formed through an ICO that uh, 
um, an initial coin offering that EOS has been running for the past year has created a bunch of stakes. So there are a lot of users who have money in the EOS operating system or the EOS community. So they'll get to vote on who the block producers are. These block producers are just computers uh, connecting to the network running the EOS software. Um, so much like a miner processes transactions on the Bitcoin network, uh, these block producers will process the transactions in a ring structure. Uh, so it starts at the node up here and then moves around the ring every uh, 0.5 seconds. Um, people are sending transactions to the network and those block producers are signing them and putting them onto the blockchain so that they're immutable. Uh, just recently, the latest white paper uh, says that one second uh, immutability, which is very fast um, compared to every other blockchain using Byzantine fault tolerance. Don't really know what that means, but that's the term that you can research if you want to. Um, so if you're familiar with Bitcoin and Ethereum, people are, those miners who are actually doing the transactions are rewarded with block rewards or transaction fees. Uh, the big question here is, well, how, who is paying these block producers? How are they getting rewards? What's in it for them? Um, the way that the block producers on EOS are rewarded is they're, they're managing this $4 billion uh, uh, or they're managing, when, when this goes online, there's 1 billion tokens and it looks like it'll be worth anywhere from 4 to 15 billion, you never know. Um, but when, uh, when it starts going live, they, new tokens are created. Uh, they're new, newly minted, and then basically through an inflation model, and those new tokens are given to the block producers uh, for their um, contribution of processing the transactions. Um, there are limits set, so there's a maximum of 5% inflation uh, on the network, um, so that it doesn't get out of control. Also, block producers are competing based on what kind of inflation that they want. So uh, right now, or at least last week, there were about 40 to 50 block producer candidates who were um, basically campaigning to get the, the right or uh, to get voted <laughs> into a live active block producer miner spot um, to process the transactions and get a piece of this inflation. And so they campaign based on like how much money they're going to give back to the community and um, uh, maybe how, what their plans for scaling are. Who chooses for the miners are? Pardon? Who chooses for who are the miners? Anyone with stake, anyone with coins can vote. And the way that you vote is you lock up your tokens in a voting contract. That contract locks your tokens up for six months. Uh, so then you get to vote like of all the um, block producer campaigning or people who are campaigning for it, you assign votes to them and then the people, the 21 with the largest amount of votes get um, put into the active portion of the network. And it can change, it's live and it's always. So I'll put some stake and then there's a campaign, like a political campaign, and then I select who I want to nominate or who I want to vote for as a miner based on my stake. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Let's grab the one back. So the, uh, are the voters also rewarded or? Uh, the voters are not rewarded uh, for locking up. Um, it's a, I've, the way that Thomas Cox, who's running the, uh, or kind of responsible for the government's, government's portion of it, it says it's really, you don't, they don't want to pay people to vote um, because otherwise you're encouraged to just throw a vote in to get paid. They want people who really care about the ecosystem and uh, have something at stake, uh, so that you'd be, you'd be locking it up for a good reason. Um, so, what if um, there's two signers that signs at the same time? Which miner wins the block? How do you determine? So they um, there's not only one block producer. Uh, so okay, every. Every cycle around this ring, uh, the order in which these block producers sign the transactions or process the transactions is uh, predetermined. 
So then it goes, the first one processes them, and then uh, the rest of the nodes sign them and verify them, and so then it just keeps going uh, around in circle, but is that... Uh, so like proof of work, you have to kind of get the exact number of zeros to get the exact number of transaction in the zero on this block. Yeah. So it's proof of stake, if anyone can sign it, then what if two persons sign it at the exact same time? There's, so that's that's a really good point because in proof of work, everyone's competing to get the right to sign the blocks. And in proof of stake, it's cooperation. So a lot of that, the computing power for Bitcoin and Ethereum or any proof of work blockchain is done, is dedicated to solving that math problem uh, to get the right to, to process the transactions. But this, these block producers are competing for votes. Uh, so everyone's competing for the community to vote them in as a block producer. And when they're voted in, uh, in say right now, there's 21 that have the highest votes, that gets locked in the, to, to a 21 ring structure. And so then they go through 21 block producers one by one until they get back to, they get to the last block producer. Then it checks the voting uh, um, contracts again to see if there's a different block producer that is in the top 21. And then, so it'll say, oh, there's a new top 21 block producers. Uh, okay, let's lock them into this next ring and determine the order. And then it'll bounce around uh, the ring of 21 block producers until it gets to the um, 21st block producer. Then it'll again find who uh, who the community supports. So there's there's not multiple block of our block producers signing transactions at once. So what are the criteria, the voting criteria? How do you select one over another? Uh, how do you as a user select? Yeah, if you're, if you're a month member and you have voting rights, how do you choose who you want to vote for? What's the, is there objective criteria or is there popularity or contrast? There is both, as far as, I'm, as, far as I know. Um, there are objective measurements on um, speed, uh, latency, and various other technical measures that I think they're sorting out how to publish that. Um, right now, the community is figuring out uh, how blog producers can uh, state that and how people can check that that's real. That's a real problem. I don't know uh, how it's going to be solved, to be honest, but it's a great question. There's also like a block producer candidate, um, EOS New York, and there's also EOS Nation. EOS Nation is uh, kind of based near Ottawa. Um, they do a lot of campaigning. It's a lot of community campaigning, and um, there's also uh, a community forum called EOS Go that's managing a lot of this, where they're trying to be very impartial, uh, randomize the list of the block producers and uh, what their websites are, and what they have promised for community projects or what they kind of what how they're going to set their infrastructure up are they going to run local uh, computers or are they going to run things off of Amazon web services um, so that's a lot of things to consider um, and so yeah if you your average user or average investor is probably not going to sift through all that but if your application uh, depends on it then you're probably interested to see what's going on and you're more likely to stick in your vote and choose wisely, but uh, yeah, that's a big question, and that's happening right now. Uh, I've got kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, are the minor rewards split evenly 21 ways, or is it proportionate to the number of votes you have? And the second one is, say I control 30% of the voting, what's to stop me from being, say, seven of the block producers myself by splitting my uh, big votes I have, by splitting the votes I have? Yeah, okay. You'd be, so, you be multiple producers. Let me answer the first one, which was, um, I believe it's even when you're in the top 21. Okay. Um, but the standby producers <laughs> here that are kind of online in case maybe five of these get shut down somehow or power goes out on the eastern seaboard or something like that or whatever, um, then the, these guys are getting paid proportional vote um, just to stay online. Um, and then, uh, what's to stop you from being multiple block producers? It's a great question. Um, I think it's a bit of uh, the community trying to figure out if someone has set up multiple accounts 
uh, to see if there's uh, multiple block producer or a block producer that's running multiple nodes. I don't have a really good answer for that one. But it's a great question. Yeah. Um, so consensus is reached not by competition like on Bitcoin, yeah? I mean, the first who gets the the fastest, uh, the longest uh, block, yeah? It's, it's not that. Yeah, it's, there's no competition. Um, yeah, like how you're talking about the way that you get rewarded in the block or in Bitcoin um, for, to get the right to the rewards. This is more of a, a community-based model. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, let me see where we are. Okay, good. Any more questions on that slide? The infrastructure is pretty complicated, Steve. Um, is there a hard cap on supply or just inflation per year? It's only inflation per year as far as I know. And I just want to mention from Mike's question, there might be an answer for how to prevent people from running multiple nodes. I just don't know it. Like, uh, but um, uh, yeah, it's, there's a hard cap on the inflation, but as far as I know, there's no hard cap on the amount of tokens that can be in the system. I'm just, with, uh, with Ethereum and some of the other blockchains where it's like a massive distributed network, and like you have proof of work or proof of stake, with this, since there's only like a set of 21 quote unquote computers that your code is going to execute on, why not just run it on Amazon? Like, what's the benefit of doing this rather than just running your own Amazon service? Yeah, that's um, a great question. I think it lies in the fact that it's uh, the decentralized aspect of it and that it's tied directly into um, your payment transaction method. So if you're running if you're running a, an application that doesn't have a blockchain, then Amazon Web Services is probably better for you. Um, but if you're yeah, it's running- more that this is not decentralized, right? This, there's a centralization of it through the, the ring of 21. Like is that right. not counter to the, the idea of a decentralized like blockchain? Um, I guess it, it all depends on how you define decentralization. It's, um, I mean, decentralization, you can argue, like, well, okay, let me just describe how this is decentralized. The block producers are located in different geographies, um, and they're able to be voted out by the community. So if there is, um, through the monitoring, uh, people are noticing that someone doesn't have good performance and they can vote them out, uh, or they're not dedicated to the, the ecosystem, they can, the ecosystem can get them removed, really. Whereas in the other, other models, um, you're also really, like, uh, if we're gonna get into a decentralized conversation, you've got mining pools that are doing proof of work and everything centralizes to areas that have uh, cheap electricity, um, so every blockchain does have a centralized problem. It really depends on what you, which one you want to go with, which one you, you believe for yourself, for your definition of decentralized, which one's better. Do you believe in the community's ability to manage and decentralize the network, or do you believe in um, kind of the jungle and the competition for lowest uh, electricity um, on the chain? And also then there's a, some blockchains do have uh, single parties who can control them in a very direct way. Whereas EOS is not launching this blockchain, so they're, they're staying uh, a third party to this intentionally to keep it more decentralized and keep it a community effort um, in that way. But yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question in the space. How do you verify the 21 are actually legitimate in terms of like, keeping track of the entries of who should sign the picks. Um, Legitimate in which respect? Like, um, how do you know who's the next signer? Uh, I, it's it's a rent. I I don't actually know the specific of that. I have to look into the, the source code, and I haven't read through the source code. Yet. But um, I, as far as I understand, every cycle it just I think it's a randomized order, but it, then it's set into a specific order. And the EOS.io software manages that when you're running the chain. It kind of figures that out and then hands it off to each block producer. But like I say, I, I could be wrong. I'm going to move on just so that Everipedia uh, has uh, enough time because uh, we do get uh, kicked out uh, 
it's quarter to eight, I think. Um, so the interesting thing is that EOS is a full stack. Uh, the block producers, they just run a ring structure. They run file storage um, using the IPS file protocol. So you can run your entire website off of um, the network um, with a deployment. This is from one of Dan Lambert's presentations. You can deploy your JavaScript, HTML, and, and all your rich media onto those disk drives. Uh, and then also your blockchain is, uh, uh, is on there as well. Um, and then the clients will communicate through uh, GraphQL uh, server. These are all things that I don't understand in very, very low detail, but um, maybe they mean a lot to some people in the audience. So I just thought that that was an interesting um, image to show uh, to you guys. Uh, the fact that it's full stack is unique. Um, you can run the front end and the back end um, on it. Uh, so back to the question, what's a community-driven business? Um, that's kind of what EOS is enabling um, with the democratic uh, delegated proof of stake system. Uh, more a voting structure that uh, puts you in touch with your users and allows them to drive um, the uh, application and the project forward uh, and allows your development team to kind of listen to what they're saying and, and move things forward. Um, so current traditional examples of this would be Facebook and Instagram. Um, they're basically uh, profiting off of everyone's content, everyone's data. Um, they're obviously they're a huge company. They're running into privacy issues and data issues right now, which is uh, why it's interesting to start putting social media and social networks onto blockchains where you have more control of your, of your data. Um, any of these guys, Airbnb, YouTube, these are communities that are contributing all the content, and then those services uh, are mainly paying employees to figure out how to extract the most advertising revenue from the platform um, using your content. Um, so these are traditional and they're not driven by the community, but I just wanted to provide this as like, this is the starting point um, and kind of the analogy that you can carry forward with. Um, so someone asked about Decentral ADAC. Um, that is also a concept that's being discussed a lot these days. Um, Decentralized Autonomous Collective is how Dan Larimer, I think, refers to it. And these are kind of like mini economies uh, that's a lot like Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be talked about as a, as a DAC, it's a decentralized autonomous collective. There's a bunch of people who have come together, created the network, develop it, move it forward. Uh, they have stake in it. Um, they're producers and they're consumers and investors. Uh, but this is kind of, this is an interesting model moving forward uh, and how this plays out will be up to you guys and, and the developer community really um, to how, you, how this is developed. Um, the key here is that these mini economies and these community driven businesses are started and uh, really designed with an incentive and reward structure uh, to encourage people to join them, encourage to people to produce on them, and uh, then have a mechanism for those producers to sell tokens uh, and recoup real money from them. Um, and so, uh, usually done through uh, encouraging mass collaboration and alignment of incentives, meaning that the incentives are all, all aligned to increase the value of the token. Uh, so, um, anyone who owns the token uh, is uh, possibly just an investor, they might be a consumer, so they're kind of consumer investors. Uh, you have producers who are creating digital content, digital assets. There's maybe external consumers who are, uh, if they want to purchase or uh, interact on the chain, um, they have to go through an exchange process. Uh, and then there's possibly just external viewers who want to see the data on the blockchain or, or see what's there, uh, but they should be able to view it in a free way. Uh, they shouldn't have to pay to just view what's on the blockchain. That's where uh, EOS is powerful and allows those types of free transactions uh, with the blockchain. Um, so, let me see if I missed anything. I think the key thing to take away from this is that these are companies that really are, are like um, foreign exchange models. They're based on macroeconomic principles much more than they are microeconomic principles. 
So there's um, anyone who owns the token is like a citizen in that community and they have uh, just like uh, you're proud to be Canadian, you're proud to be in that uh, ecosystem and that economy and so you're really driven to make it better and uh, make your token worth more. Uh, so I think what this does is really connect users to the developers and it's the alignment of incentives, um, uh, possibly really bringing down the barriers of feedback and communication between early adopters of any um, business venture or platform and the developers who are usually quite isolated uh, from those early adopters. Uh, so anyways, it, it also really is set up to uh, hasten adoption uh, through the possible gain of tokens and, and things like that. And uh, if you were to summarize like a value prop for EOS over Ethereum other than proof of stake and speed of blocks, like what would that value prop be? Community, um, getting more users involved in projects and uh, voting mechanism to uh, get that feedback, I guess. Um, that's from my perspective. So kind of, uh, two questions on that. One is, um, when we say community, is it one community or does every application developer have their own community? So you'll, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the second question is, could you go through a space example, uh, because some of the terminology I'm not too clear on. So you know, what is a consumer, what is an investor, what is a producer? And uh, I'm gonna let Everpedia talk more about okay. stuff like that because I think they'll do a better job of it um, and than I will. But this was just to kind of get the concept of DAX out there and, and that it's more of a foreign exchange kind of model. But yeah, you can, I, I believe the way you can set it up, you can set up your own blockchain with your own token or you can set up a blockchain with uh, that doesn't have a token. Maybe it'll use the, the primary EOS token, whatever that token gets named or maybe it's gonna be called EOS. Um, those are questions right now. Uh, but yeah, like you can imagine this, EOS itself is a DAC. Uh, it is one of these. You can blow this up and then you can then put the, another small one inside of it uh, where you have an exchange between EOS and that uh, organization. I think that's what Everpedia is doing. They will have their own IQ token, uh, but I don't know if, uh, I mean, they will be running off of the EOS blockchain or using the computing infrastructure. Um, but I don't know how connected they're going to be with any EOS token. Um, but from the sounds of it, if anyone's familiar with the Bancor protocol, um, it sounds that's being baked into EOS, it seems, which is an automated way to exchange funds between um, these kinds of uh, mini economies without an exchange. So that would allow these types of tokens to exist in the EOS infrastructure and allow those tokens to instantly transfer or be exchanged between each other um, using that kind of bank or uh, algorithm uh, that is being implemented. Let me just fast forward, I want to get the repeat you guys, what well, really blew up the brightness here. Uh, Steemit was what I talked about, Dan Larimer was one of his first um, ventures here. And they call themselves a new attention economy. That's an interesting concept where the bloggers create content and um, you're given posting rewards, curating rewards, and there's something called Steam Power. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but users are rewarded for their contributions and Steam can be traded on exchanges and used to promote content on Steemit. So the game is that if someone wants to promote content on Steemit, advertise on Steemit, then they're buying tokens from the people who created the content on Steemit. Um, so it's a direct community to advertiser, whereas on Facebook, if you create content and people are attracted to it, Facebook gets all of your advertising revenue, whereas um, you're getting it as, as a participant in the community here. Uh, and then Everpedia is another example of a community-run uh, business, uh, or community-driven business. Uh, so I'm going to get Sam on the main screen so he can talk about his project and why they're using blockchain and why uh, they're using EOS.